So we're back working on this 2013 F-150 XLT. It was here a couple weeks ago and we put a BCM in it and programmed it. And it's back doing exactly the same thing as it was doing before. You see the hazards are on. Let's start it up. Driver's door ajar, passenger door ajar, left rear door ajar, right rear door ajar, low brake fluid. Let's put it in reverse, check park aid. It says the, it sometimes says that the parking brake is on, brake warning light is on, low brake fluid message will come up, hazards won't shut off. Power door locks don't work from the switches. Interior light is on now, but it doesn't come on. I'm opening the doors because it thinks the doors are already open. Anyways, the reference voltage for all these pull down circuits from the BCM has failed. This is the third BCM that's been put in here. I put a used one in last week and uh, reprogrammed it to the vehicle. And it worked for a couple of days and then it did the same thing. Apparently the history of this vehicle was there was a hole in the windshield at one point and water was allowed to enter behind a dash somewhere up in this area up here. I had looked at all the modules in this area and everything looked pristine, but obviously something is killing the BCMs in this thing. The dealer put two in under, put one in customer pay, one in under warranty and then said the water entry was causing the problem. And I diagnosed it as a second failed BCM, but obviously that's not the problem. So another shop has temporarily installed a disconnect switch on here so that it doesn't kill the battery. So here is another used BCM. This one's out of a 2014, so it's not exactly correct for the vehicle, and I couldn't program it. One of the uh, recycling yards gave me all of the connectors they cut them off so that allowed me to uh, bench test this ECM or BCM I should say so I've got battery ground connected to two wires going into this connector that are our grounds got main power supply coming in and ignition power simulated with these two wires because these two circuits here on this connector are run crank and run accessory and you can see I've, I've got a voltmeter connected to the hazard switch circuit and it's reading 11 volts. Um, when I connect up the ignition power to this thing, this relay turns on in here. So I've actually taken apart the failed BCM. This is it here. And I cannot see anything wrong with it whatsoever. I was trying to backwards engineer it if I could to figure out what component supplies the, uh, well in this case 11 to 12 volts to all of these pull down switches. See this is a lock switch circuit, this is the uh, park brake warning circuit, this is the unlock circuit and I'm sure that if we test those circuits they'll all have 11 volts on them. Let's try the unlock circuit. So that's the unlock circuit and it's 11 volts. And this is the, uh, what is this one? Park brake switch, 11 volts. And of course, on the used BCM or the failed BCM, all of those pull down voltages are, are missing for some reason. Now, I don't have fuses in here, nor do I have a relay in here. So I wanted to see what I needed to make this thing work theoretically based on this one. Obviously, if I pull this out, I'll see if I lose the uh, voltage. So I used a test light to check which fuses are actually live. And of course, well, I did have power on that one. This fuse down here seems to supply or turn on a relay, which in turn turns on a bunch of other fuses. But I pulled this fuse out and I lost the voltage on my switch circuit. So that's this corner fuse in the corner. So I'm going to try just installing that one 
to see if I have voltage on this test board because that seems to be the one in question. Come on, photo bomber. So with that single fuse installed into the board in this corner, this 10 amp fuse, negative connected to the two ground terminals in this connector, power supplied to the main bus bar here. Um, I show 0.96 volts on that, that uh, hazard switch wire and I'm sure the other wires, which I don't have plugged in here, are going to be low voltage as well. Um, I've pulled all the extra fuses out of this fuse box now to see if it works with just that single fuse in there. You can hear a relay click on and off when I take away the battery power. So there's a relay that powers up and this fuse is live. Anyways, we're going to re reconnect to this fuse panel here that works and try it with just that one fuse in it, make sure that it functions. Okay, so that's set up exactly the same way as this one. So when it push this fuse in, you can hear a relay click. And now we get 11 volts on that hazard switch circuit. So with just that one fuse, oh, I got this circuit breaker in here. So maybe I'll pull that 30 amp circuit breaker out of here too, because I don't think that has anything to do with it. I think that's for power windows, but we'll see. With that main 30 amp circuit breaker out and only this 10 amp corner fuse in here, which I'm not sure which one that is, it uh, supplies voltage to the hazard switch circuit at 11.09 volts. Let's check the uh, door lock switch circuit, 11.09 volts. So obviously there's some type of supply voltage source inside this BCM that has failed in this one. Um, I don't know if it has to do with that micro relay in there. Obviously, when you pull this fuse out, you can hear a relay turning off. Let me get this fuse out of here. Now I can't get it in. There, you can hear it. Now it's not working. What happened? Maybe it went to sleep. So today we're going to do an exploratory on this Ford truck. Probably something I should have done long ago. We're going to remove the entire dash. So have a look at it. Potential water damage. So I've started by removing the sill plates. These plastic panels here. The uh, A-pillar panels beside the thing. You can see that there are some fasteners that hold the dash here there's three fasteners here I believe there's one up in here so we have to take these a pillar clips off or brackets off um, yeah I'm not sure if I need to remove the console it depends whether or not we have to get underneath the carpet but we'll see so remove the upper a pillar panels there's a side curtain airbag in here so be careful of that got the battery disconnected now um, the wiring harness to the tweeter runs down here to a connector in the dash so you have to unplug that on the other side we have to remove the uh, grab handle and then there are two plastic pieces that just pop off here that have to come off and I think we're gonna have to take this off because I think there's some screws under there as well pop these caps off there's two seven millimeter headed bolts in there and then wiring harnesses I mentioned in here for the speaker, the tweeter in, in this thing. Connector should come out of there. There we go. Put that in the back. Now there is a fastener way down inside there if I'm not mistaken well there is on the driver's side I don't see one on the passenger side just these two here uh, 
Um, I think we got to take the glove box off. I take, took the uh, under panel trim off and the knee bolster. It's easier to get in there to see the the uh, emergency brake release. Got to undo that. And the shift cable, we got to undo that from the transmission. There's a little rubber insert in here, and then there's two 7 mil bolts in here. We'll have to get at those. So I bought this little ratchet the other day that works really good for this type of scenario here. It's like a 90 degree drive Use a, to get those screws out. As I mentioned, there's a bolt way back in there that you have to access with a universal joint. I don't see one on the passenger side, just on the driver's side on the left side. So there are three connectors behind the hood release. Take the hood release off, undo these three connectors, pull the push pin out, disconnect the park brake brake release cable from the park brake mechanism, remove the pinch bolt on the steering shaft right here, and then push the steering shaft down away from the steering column. I'm hoping the steering column can stay attached to the dash assembly. I think it can. All right, we'll continue. There is another connector way up in here. I think that one's gonna have to be disconnected as well. It's got a lever on it, but one at a time. So remove the three bolt or three screws on the bottom of the glove box, take the glove box out that accesses I think four connectors in here. Unplug the connectors, disconnect this airbag. I don't know if we have to remove this airbag yet. There's a couple plastic push pins on the bottom of this piece on the base of the column. So remove that and pry it out. It's got two plastic clips on the top. Put that in the back of the truck. Now there should be some bolts in the bottom of the column here. Bottom of the column, bottom of the dash right here. Two there on either side. So disconnect the airbag and the antenna connector and then one, two, three, four, five connectors from the BCM and unclip the harness from the attached BCM. That's going to stay with the dash. So looking from the top of the dash, you can see the, the bolt, You've got the windshield glare there. You can see that bolt through the opening there right there so there's going to be one on either side be careful not to damage the windshield with an air ratchet or an electric ratchet so it turns out there are two uh, 13 millimeter headed bolts on the driver's side and only a single one on the passenger side and like I said on the driver's side there's a bolt in there as well which I've already gotten with a long extension in the universal joint so it turns out we have to remove the console even on this one it doesn't go underneath the dash but there's a wiring harness going to the airbag module, which is under the console. There are two bolts that hold the console to the floor, and they're beside the seat. You can't get at them, so we have to take the seats out. So there's two bolts in the front and two bolts in the back. Uh, hindsight, it would have been wise to take the seats out or unbolt them at least from the floor prior to uh, disconnecting the battery because you can't move these electric seats now with no battery. And what did you do with that bolt? Ford, in their infinite wisdom, used a bolt that's two and a half inches longer than it needs to be. This much sticks through the floor right down into the element so it's full of rust. So spray, spray it from underneath with penetrating fluid. Three of them you can see. The fourth one is inside a caged housing in here underneath the floor so you can't get at it. I'm not sure if you move the seat fully forward electrically if you'd be able to get at this with an impact gun. but. We're gonna figure out how to get it out. So once you get the seat out of the way, you can unplug these two connectors on the two seats and tilt it and move it back or put it outside the cab. There's four bolts that hold the console down and there's one wiring harness to a uh, accessory plug on the back. And underneath here, this is why we went here in the first place, is the ABS module and we need to unplug that harness because it's gonna come out with the, da with the dash it runs all the way from here up to the dash 
Plus, I couldn't move the, the dash back far enough with the console in the way because the heater controls would hit the console. So we should be able to tilt it back now. So once you get that wiring harness unplugged from the airbag module, it's actually clipped to this bracket underneath here, here, and here. So you have to lift the carpet up and pry the clips off to get the harness out because that's going to stay attached to the dash. Now we're going to lay this seat cover or fender cover on here so that we don't mark up the heater controls and we're going to set the, the dash pad back on top of that. So there was one other thing you have to disconnect and that's the gear shift cable. When the dash is tilted back you can see this little link, this little tab. Pry that, slide the cable out of the bracket and then pop it off with a fork tool. Uh, we'll attach that when we're back in. So now we're going to look to see if we can see any evidence of water entry. They said the windshield was leaking and it had water entry in the middle of the windshield over there. So we're going to have a look. Well, I'm very disappointed after all this physical work here. I'm looking for signs of water entry here. There's a little stain right here, but nothing significant. None of these electrical connectors have any signs of any moisture, as do the connectors to the BCM. Um, I don't see any place where the windshield seal was compromised. You can see that it's got a new windshield seal in it. They said that there was an area in this area here where there was rust on the seal and they had to fix it. There's some moisture there, some stain there, but that would leak into the heater. That could be just a spilled pop or something, because water wouldn't be pink. Hmm. And I'm looking inside here. There's a module in here, and I pulled this connector out, and it looks absolutely pristine. No signs of water in there. No signs of water in any of this stuff. Oh boy. And looking underneath the carpet here. No rust. No moisture. At least not on this side, not right now. So what's causing the repeated failure of these BCMs? So I've searched the internet high and low. I've searched Identifix and various other information sites. The, here is a case that I found before when I was diagnosing this. Hazard flasher is on all the time, will not shut off, door ajar light staying on, power door locks do not work, parking brake light stays on, self-tested BCM results in same codes I have. So basically they're saying replace the BCM, which I've done. There's two other cases here, replace BCM. Replacement of the BCM will require reprogramming. Yes, of course, I know that. But something is killing these BCMs. The original one failed, the dealer stalled two, I installed a third one, and they've all failed with exactly the same failure sequence, same symptoms. So I can't see what's causing it. And it can't be a short to ground on those circuits because that's all those circuits do anyways is ground. I also tested the alternator in case it might be overcharging and I, I never caught it going higher than 14.6 volts. So I, I, I don't know what to do here. I'm kind of at a loss. Maybe somebody has some suggestions.